Thank you very much. And before I get started, I want to just uh, compliment you, Orest, and uh, your entire team uh, here at Humber for how gracious you've been, how welcoming you've been, uh, this amazing facility, and, uh, and, the, and the minds that you have brought together here. So I'm grateful to, uh, to be a part of this today. So kudos to you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I look a little different than I do up there. So, um, uh, but I want to start with a story. And, and the story is sort of one that begins with a question, which is, what does a broadcaster have to do with navigation? What, what does broadcasting have to do with navigation? And uh, as mariners and as pilots, very early on, AM radio signals were used as beacons by which mariners and pilots would navigate, right? They were a transmission from a known fixed location that they could use to say, aha, th this is where I am based off of I know where that transmission is coming from. That is what is known as a signal of opportunity. What I want to talk to you today about is what I call a signal of purpose. And what we've done and what we're attempting to do, because we're in the prototype phase, but what we're attempting to do is to take a signal of opportunity and turn it into a signal of purpose. One that you tune to intentionally because you know that it is going to provide that precise timing that you need as well as the derivative works that can come from it. So that's what I hope to talk about today when I talk about BPS or the broadcast positioning system. Now, you heard from Dr. Diamond earlier, and some of our slides are going to overlap a little bit because uh, we have been collaborating on this since we met at the DOT a year or so ago. And, um, uh, and I really uh, want to say how much I appreciate the education I've received. Because if I go back a little bit more, um, when we first envisioned BPS, there were three of us at, at NAB that did that. Uh, the real expert is Tariq Mandal, and you're going to hear from him later. He's got a timing background. I am not a timing expert. I have a broadcast background. I've been operationally involved in broadcasting for 25 plus, 30 years. Uh, but then we also have a spectrum expert, Bob Weller. But the three of those experts, you know, and I'll loosely call myself an expert, we came together and we wrote a paper, and I'll reference it later, that, that was the foundation of BPS. We didn't know about executive orders. We didn't know about, you know, the, the, the threat vectors. We didn't know about the concept of a day without space. We were just, you know, sort of, you know, engineers tinkering with uh, technical ideas. But, but so that's where we got started. But, but when we went to the DOT meeting and we met folks like, like Pat and Andrew, and we said, well, wait a minute. You know, there is a real problem, there is a real challenge that we have an opportunity to help solve. And while we call it BPS and we think about the navigational aspects of that, what we came to understand is that there is a precision timing component that this critical infrastructure depends on. And if we focus First and foremost on that, then we can become a part of the fabric of PNT, right? Uh, to Andrew's words, we don't want to be a backup. We want to be a part of the fabric of the PNT solutions, uh, not just in the United States, but obviously by a show of our being here today in Canada. And I would share with you that we have had uh, conversations with uh, the Republic of Korea. And when we talk with them, they're like, oh, yeah. It's an issue here. The folks up north jam our signals all the time. You know, and, and, and he said it very calmly. It causes all kinds of civil unrest. And I'm, I bet it does. You know, so, so we're, we're very focused on 
you know, these um, uh, critical infrastructure areas and, and, and Pat hit on those earlier. He hit on, like, when we got started, I didn't know what a nanosecond was. Can I say that? I feel like I'm confessional. You know, and there was a microsecond, a millisecond, a nanosecond, and I was like, holy smokes. And then Dana gave a talk about the Romans and how they, you know, measured time in sundials. And, and I was like, okay, well, we are really getting precise now. And, um, but, so, you know, these are the microsecond, basically, and 200 nanoseconds satisfying uh, all requirements. I know now that a nanosecond is a billionth of a second, and that, you know, that's the speed of light, right? Yeah, so I'm learning here. Um, but from a broadcast perspective, what I know is that we can deliver through the work that we've done is that we can meet these needs. When you drop to the bottom line there, 200 nanoseconds satisfies all requirements. What I know is that we have the ability to do that with BPS. So I know that there are several audiences here today. There's some broadcast audiences, there's some academic audiences, there's some technology audiences, um, there's policy audience. So I just wanted to take a second and back up and say, well, what is ATSC3? Right, ATSC stands for the Advanced Television Systems Committee. It is an international standards development organization. And I really appreciate what Andrew said earlier about the importance of having this being based on uh, a standard. And not just a standard, but an international standard because proprietary solutions aren't really what uh, we need in, in this environment, in my opinion. So the ATSC goes, you know, back many decades, uh, but this the popular name for this is Next Gen TV. And so this, this, this system was principally developed to deliver audio and video television better than, you know, ever before. Um, and it says completed in 2018, but this standard is meant to evolve over time. But So it was first published in 2018. And in the United States, we started deployment uh, in 2019. Uh, the Republic of Korea started earlier uh, than that. They began their deployment before um, uh, the standard was even complete. The, the key thing about this is it is the world's first broadcast, terrestrial broadcast standard that uses IP as its transport layer. So it is natively uh, a, a, a uh, IP uh, network system. Uh, and so this says it can deliver data with television. You know, I like to think television is a form of data. So the video and the audio is a form of data. So this is a one big data pipe, and what you decide to do with those packets uh, is, is up to you. You can traditionally do audio and video. We're going to talk about another use of that uh, data today. Um, it is a terrestrial system. You can receive it indoors. Um, and so uh, that, that was something that was highlighted earlier uh, as a real uh, benefit as well. Um, so with BPS, it leverages the ATSC3 transmission standard, uh, and it is a system and a method of, of looking at uh, time and position. It is fully standards compliant. So it has been implemented uh, with the help, there he is, uh, Mark Coral. Uh, it has been implemented uh, uh, into the standard. It is not part of the standard. When, when we sat down and we wrote the standard, we didn't you know, design this into it and standardize it, but it is, it is fully standards compliant. Uh, and it uses the data casting feature or data broadcast feature. Uh, and, and as envisioned, it is completely independent and stand alone, which makes it exceptionally complementary. Um, and it does not depend on a cellular signal or a GPS signal uh, or even internet connectivity. So when you think about uh, all of the different scenarios that are out there, uh, it makes it a very complementary system, uh, again, in the PNT fabric uh, to GPS. So the, what I want to talk about here and Pat hit, uh, hit on this a little bit earlier, but this is the breakdown of, of the uh, ATSC3 frame. And what I want to emphasize is this is not to scale, right? 
This is not to scale. The bootstrap, the preamble, and, and that first little data PLP might be 1% or 2% of your signal, and then you've got your payload. Right, but for the purposes of making it visible and understandable, we wanted to really, you know, spell it out. So the bootstrap defines the waveform that you're going to be on. Uh, the preamble uh, announces the emission time. That is where, you know, every one of these ATSCT frames is going to have uh, a timestamp in it. And then that data PLP stands for physical layer pipe. And we're not going to go into all that, but uh, I, I did want to just at least explain what PLP was. But that PLP or that piece of data, that's where we're going to say this is the tower's location, right? So when you get that timestamp, you also know where it came from. And if you're operating critical infrastructure like a power substation, you also know where you are. You're not moving around. So all of a sudden, you've got the components you need to really have a time of arrival. You know when the time left and you know what your time of arrival was and you can, you can really have precision time. And then of course what we have there at the bottom is a GNSS independent reference time. And so we'll talk about that as well. But the idea with all of this is that it becomes traceable time uh, in the US that's going to be back to NIST. Um, uh, for, for us, uh, but ultimately, as, as Pat said, it's going to go to UTC, um, and it will be traceable time. These are all the same calculations that you're going to do with GPS. They're possible with BPS. You're just using terrestrial signals as opposed to um, mid-Earth orbit satellites. Uh, now, what I would, what I would Offer is a little bit later. I'm going to talk about some hybrid solutions uh, as well. So, but because you can use the same equations and formulas, you might be able to blend a tower in with your satellites. So, um, what are the capabilities of um, of BPS? Um, you know, this really lays it out there in terms of getting 100 nanosecond accuracy, uh, and then the positioning, you might say, wait a minute, you know, that's, that's not great positioning. GPS is, is much more accurate than that, and that's, that's quite true. Uh, but again, when you've got a hybrid uh, environment, you can uh, begin to, to blend those two if you were to lose, um, uh, lose access to a satellite. Uh, but importantly, I think, is that you can, you, if you've got this independent solution, you've got the ability to detect when GPS is being spoofed or hacked or there's an issue there, right? So if you're trying to just have situational awareness, um, BPS can really uh, help you do that. And then, you know, again, you can, you can combine the systems. It's not a failover. It's not a backup. It's part of the fabric of, 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 uh, of PNT. So why, um, this is talking about in the U.S., again, how our frequencies are laid out. What we're really talking about here is having a high power, high tower um, network of precision time transmitters. So if you look at uh, a GPS signal, you're talking about a low power signal that is coming from very far away. Um, if you're talking, and, and if you're talking about uh, a BPS signal, you're talking about a very high power signal that is frequency diverse, uh, that is coming at a at a different angle as well, uh, and can be received inside buildings. Um, why is this important? We'll get into a little bit later. Um, you know, if somebody we we talked about, and and Pat has talked about this before. Um, and, and it was talked about earlier, hey, we can't jam GPS to test it, right? You know, to, but so you can go buy a GPS jammer off of Amazon, but it's illegal to use, right? So, um, but it would, and, and you can do that because it operates at a very discrete set of frequencies and it's low power. It would be very difficult to jam the entire television frequency, especially you know on a on a geographic basis. So, one of the advantages we see is really the diversity of frequencies 
that television is transmitted on uh, as, as part of the BPS solution. So where are we with next-gen TV? So this, or ATSC3 in the deployment. So it, as I mentioned, it is a new standard. It was, uh, deployment began in 2019. Uh, this is from the ATSC website and the, the markets there in orange. This is uh, obviously uh, done by designated market area as opposed by actual signal strength because you can see by the geography of the lines there, they're so hard. But um, about 70% of the U.S. television households are now in a market that has uh, ATSC3 on the air. Some of those markets have multiple transmitters. Most of them have uh, have one. Uh, and um, uh, early next year, the most recent markets that came online were in uh, Minneapolis, Philadelphia, New York. Next year, uh, next January, Chicago and San Diego are going to be coming online, uh, and we've got more markets uh, after that. So we are in the process of transitioning to ATSC3, and so that's part of what we're thinking about as we um, think about a BPS uh, deployment as well. But when you move to looking at what does it look like at full deployment, um, this is a map of um, uh, that Bob Weller uh, created for us, and this is coverage at one and a half meter antenna height. So, you know, um, um, pretty low uh, antenna height for the receiver. Um, and, and you can see that basically you have uh, full coverage, uh, CONUS coverage uh, of the U.S. and extends out into uh, uh, coastal waters and, and, and even bleeds over uh, a little bit on uh, the geographic lines. So um, if you look at the signal reception and you go down and you say, well, I'm not going to be at one and a half meters height. But at one and a half meters high, on average, you're going to be able to pick up 17 different signals. Uh, if you say, well, I've, I'm, I'm going to mount my antenna up in the air and I'm going to monitor different signals, you can, at 50 meter antenna height, um, uh, the, it shows that you can receive 70 different signals. So again, you've got a very resilient, a very robust, a very redundant uh, sort of uh, architecture that has, has great coverage. So if you boil that down into a single market, this is looking at WHUT, uh, which is the, the station in uh, Washington, D.C. that is serving as the host station uh, for that market. Uh, you can see the details of the antenna height and the power here and its, its channel. Um, you can see the type of coverage that you get on a 50-50 basis uh, for uh, BPS. Now, it's important to note, if you go back to that, you know, this is not to scale. That preamble and that data PLP are much more tunable, much more more easily received than that payload that's going to carry your audio and video. So it's much easier to receive it and decode it because it, it operates at a different uh, noise floor threshold. So, um, but this is the type of coverage that you can get out of one tower. I believe, Tariq, you're going to talk more about what a network might look like in your more detailed technical presentation later. Um, Suffice it to say that, you know, this is what we're looking at and one of what we see as one of the benefits of BPS is the fact that you are at that high power, high tower, and you do cover such a significant portion of, of geography uh, from, uh, from, from a transmitter, uh, much different than other uh, sorts of telecommunications networks uh, that, are, that are out there. So, which leads me to, you know, wanting to highlight what I do see as, as the benefits. If you were looking at, at, at trying to deploy a solution, it really helps to have all the infrastructure already built. You don't have to go out and build new towers. You don't have to install new generators. These are, are you know, that infrastructure is already there uh, and operational. And, and quite honestly, it is being operated in a way that it is meant to be on the air on a 24 by 7 by 365 basis. You have UPS backup, you have generator backup, and, and broadcasting is, is there uh, in times of disaster and delivers 
the uh, emergency uh, alerts and information. So it's designed to be there when you need it most already. So not only is the infrastructure built, but it, it's very reliable infrastructure. As I said earlier, you're based on a global standard that helps um, in, in knowing that you, you're, you've got something that is uh, non-proprietary, but also that can be deployed uh, in, in other places. Uh, it's a passive service. This is another way of saying you've got unlimited users. You don't require an internet connection. You're not going to all of a sudden overwhelm the service because it's broadcast, right? You've got one to many. You can have an unlimited number of users and that aligns very well with how GPS uh, works today as well. Um, it, it is independent. It can work, uh, you know, uh, without having uh, GPS or internet or uh, or cellular connectivity. Um, uh, and then we talked about the diversity and the coverage uh, already. So our first gen prototype uh, is one again that uh, I'd like to compliment Mark Coral of Triveni. Uh, and Vlad of Avitech, uh, they've been instrumental partners and we're very grateful for your leadership in this. But uh, we, we did this first prototype, we installed it in uh, our test bed in Washington, D.C., uh, invited Andrew and Karen and others from the DOT to come visit our lab and, and see uh, what we could do. And, and you can see the system uh, installed there in the first prototype. And I think we were getting uh, 300 nanosecond accuracy with that. Now what you're going to, and that's in the lab, what you're going to see later today is our second gen prototype um, in the lab, which was much more accurate. I'm not going to steal your thunder, Tariq. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave it to you. Uh, and, but he'll talk about the level of accuracy that we're getting today. Uh, but I've already sort of let you know that it, it, it fulfills um, you know, the requirements of all the critical infrastructure. But the other thing that is today is that this isn't just in the lab. We are live and on the air at a real transmission facility. So uh, that's, that's exciting as well. Um, this is our overall timeline. Uh, you know, phase one, we completed. We're in the midst of phase uh, two now. This is a big part of, of what we wanted to do uh, was to be able to, um, you know, take it out of the lab and put it on the air for the first time. And we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit later. But you, you can see that we've got a lot more work to do. Uh, uh, and we are still, you know, in the, uh, in the prototype phase. Uh, but we're excited about the results that we're seeing and we're excited about, uh, about where it can go. And, and then these are the papers. So if you have an interest in reading uh, about BPS, the, the, the first one is the one that Tariq and Bob and I did, published back in 2021. Uh, the other two were done uh, in concert with, uh, um, uh, with, with Mark and with Vlad and with Andrew and with Pat. Uh, and, uh, and, and then I would just uh, invite you to stay tuned. Uh, sorry uh, for the pun there, but stay tuned uh, and, and think about attending NAB show in April because we're, we'll definitely have uh, more, more information there. Um, but hopefully that is a high level view of BPS um, and the way that it is based on the ATSC3 standard, the benefits that it provides, and then uh, Tariq and, and company will be able to provide uh, details of exactly where we are with the current prototype and, and actually how it works. So with that, I will say thank you and uh, look forward to uh, spending time with you for the rest of the day. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, we actually have time for a few questions. If anyone has questions for Sam, um, we'll uh, bring a mic over to you, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sam. That was very interesting. The morning started off with talking about all the major industries that are dependent on GPS, like um, power plants, financial, et cetera. So, in this system, where do receivers fit in? Do power plants 
for, for this to be truly complementary, do power plants need new receivers and financial transaction systems and everything yes. else? So when you go to those facilities today, you're likely going to see a GPS antenna and, and receiver, and that's what's providing it. And uh, so, yes, you would need a new receiver that also uh, receives the BPS signal. And one of the things that we're really encouraged about, again, is the fact that so many different towers can be viewed, especially if you're at one of these in, um, uh, locations and you're able to mount that antenna uh, pretty high up, you're going to get, uh, you know, again, on average 70 signals. But even if you, you mount it, um, you know, at one and a half meters, you're talking about getting 17 on average. Again, I have to emphasize those are are on average, but ultimately that is what we see is that yes, you would get a receiver and, and where we'd like for it to go is you would have a, a combination unit that is both GPS and BPS. So it, it receives both uh, at the same time. Now, you know, again, we're in the prototype phase, but that is a, a vision that, uh, is, that, that we have is you'd have a, a basically an ensemble and it would look at, at both of those. That's also how you would be, not that you would necessarily do this on an operational basis, but that would also be how you could detect if, if uh, you know, one of them is wonky or not, perhaps being hacked or, or spoofed or, or jammed is because you, you're receiving both signals at the same time and you can compare them. Hello, Tess. Yeah. <laughs> um, just wondering if you'd clarify, I'm getting caught up on the semantics a little bit. Uh, you said GNSS independent time reference on this, the one slide. So is it using GNSS or not? So um, the, the answer is it's not. Um, well, the answer is two things. The prototype, yes, it is. We are using that right now. But as envisioned in full deployment, and Tariq will get into that, it would not. So for the purposes of development, it's just very cost effective to say, all right, I need that time signal. So what, what you're going to see later today, it is using GNSS um, uh, as a source timing signal, but in uh, full deployment, in a commercial deployment, it would not. Sam, we only met last night, but I feel comfortable enough to ask a really naive question you know, coming from the GNSS point. When I think of my television, I think of fiber optic, you know, uh, reception on my digital cable box. Um, can you speak of, about, you had the deployment map, but can you speak about, you know, broadcast over the air signals versus um, the fiber? And, 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 you know, in the States and Canada and other countries, you know, where, where are we going? Because I yeah. I kind of thought I stopped getting my signal from the CN Tower a long time ago. Yeah. So but I just don't know. I, I can speak about what's happening in the U.S. I can't speak about what's happening in Canada. What's happening in the U.S. is that over the past decade, over-the-air usage has been steadily growing. So what is happening is as people are cutting the cord, they're cutting their cable bundle, they're adopting streaming in combination with over-the-air broadcasting. So it has been steadily growing in the U.S. in terms of usage. And uh, according to Forbes, roughly 7 to 8 million antennas are sold each year. So what we're seeing in the U.S. is streaming has sort of been on a hockey stick. People are adopting streaming. Uh, broadcast is, is steadily growing. And what people are doing is what I call BYOB. They're build, build your own bundle. So what folks are doing is they're saying, well, okay, I know I want the most popular content, which, you know, is usually the NFL uh, and local news. Yeah. <laughs> well, interesting note, because this is also what's happening in the U.S., is that Regional sport networks on cable are struggling, and a lot of that content, including the NHL, is going back to broadcast. And so I think the trend of people using over the air is, is going to accelerate even more as more content moves that way. So um, roughly, depending on whose numbers you believe, 25%, 20-25% of uh, households in the U.S., 
are um, have an over-the-air receiver uh, in them and, and are using. Sometimes some households have one TV set that's over the air, another one that they might still have uh, tied in. But um, what we're seeing with broadcast as a means of, of the core business is that is, is still very much there uh, and growing and being bundled with, with, uh, with streaming. No, it's a great question because it speaks to the health of the overall system. Excuse me, I might just add one comment if I could to add another layer of context is, in some ways you could actually think of ATSC, Advanced Television Systems Committee, as ADSC, Advanced Data Systems Committee, because we're actually involved in deploying television applications, but also non-television data casting applications, applications that your TV receiver will never receive. There's a bit in that preamble that you can designate and say, this is not meant for a television. This is meant for a dedicated receiver that is perhaps still to be built or still to be designed or still to be integrated. So in a way, this type of application for ATSC helps actually redefine the face of what television is in our conventional understanding and history collectively of what television is. So I, it's, yes, and as, as Sam mentioned, broadcast is infinitely scalable. The more receivers you have on the network, the more efficient the network is. It doesn't get bogged down with traffic. It actually consumes traffic. It eats so, traffic. And if I could add, because I, I talked about where we were with the market deployment um, using Consumer Technology Association numbers. Uh, there will be 10 million ATSC TV sets uh, uh, in the market um, as of uh, the end of this year. Uh, they are projecting in 2024 five that one in three TV sets will be uh, next gen and they're saying that's really the going to be the inflection point uh, and and really by 2028 it's almost hundred percent of TVs they're projecting will be next gen uh, and then there's also going to be other sort of third-party receivers but uh, they're really focused on that so uh, from a consumer perspective um, you know it's manufacturers like Sony all they make is a next gen TV set and, and I guess, sorry, not, not to interject unduly here, but just one last thing to think about is there's a market adoption strategy for television, but then there's market adoption strategies for these other applications. And they can be independent of each other. From It, dic it dictates that a regulatory framework has to exist for that. Um, and those are regulatory conversations. But certainly, we can decouple the television applications and say it could very well be that a country like Canada adopts next-gen television, not for front-facing television, but for non-television applications for new B2B and B2C models. And that's something that our lab healthily explores in a lot of ways where we, we can look at it as a data system versus just a conventional television system. I, I certainly hope that helps round yeah. out the explanation. Yeah. Thanks. So um, Pat made a really good point. So the receivers and the receiver, uh, they, they don't need to decode audio and video. They don't have to, all they have to do is be able to decode the, the BPS part of the signal. So um, uh, it, you can build a much lower cost receiver uh, than you would uh, if you were trying to you know, do everything that ATSC3 enabled. Thank you. Uh, following up uh, the question of our uh, colleague, uh, what I have understood that uh, this uh, BPS solution could be used by uh, other system of other sectors. Uh, could you please uh, na name, for example, some uh, some uh, some applications or sectors? Uh, second question, uh, please do uh, do you have an idea of uh, similar systems? Solutions, I mean, uh, being developed or implement, already implemented uh, in uh, other systems. Thank you. Yeah. So, what I'll, in terms of who might receive that, I would say anybody who needs critical timing infrastructure that's using GPS today. So, if you're uh, uh, any place where there's a synchrophase or a microphaser, if you're in a power grid situation, you, you could receive it. If you're operating a data center, if you're a financial transaction center, uh, if you're a gas station who is trying to timestamp your credit card swipes, if you're a cell tower, right? If you're a cell tower, 
BPS can become, you know, part of your fabric of maintaining your timing accuracy so that you can, um, you know, one of the use cases that was described was uh, truckers that didn't want to be tracked were putting GPS jammers just on their truck and they would drive around. Well, what they were doing was screwing up all the cell towers as they drove down the highway, right? So, I mean, you, you know, if, if you're, we won't get into the ethics of that, but that's, you know, that is what was happening. And so if you were a cell tower and you had, you know, a dual BPS, GPS receiver, uh, you'd still be in, in, in good shape. Yeah, and there's a variety of other folks that are looking at other types of solutions. I'd encourage you to look at uh, the work that uh, Andrew and the DOT uh, did where they evaluated a, a number of different systems that are, that are out there. Um, many of them have their own, you know, pros and cons. Okay. There's been some alluding to the broadcast industry uh, providing the PNT service, as well as being a consumer of the PNT service. So how would that be accomplished? Uh, would there be a stratification of infrastructure for that? Yes, there would be. And I think that, um, you know, the first thing that we would have to do uh, is exactly the question that was asked earlier. We would, to provide that service, we would have to say, okay, we're not using GPS as our input. Right, we would have to say, I'm going to get that signal into this network, and Tariq's going to elaborate on this later. But I'm either going to have a fiber feed or some other non-GNSS feed uh, into as the source signal. Again, what we ultimately want is traceable time. Um, once fully deployed, though, you would be able to have uh, a scenario where, again, you have a fabric where. Um, not only is uh, BPS being distributed by broadcasters, but it doesn't mean that everybody's going to go, oh, well, I have BPS now, so I'm taking out my GPS infrastructure. Again, no, that's not what we want. That's, I mean, we're talking about creating a PNT fabric, and so, you know, you would have a, a situation where a broadcast facility would, I'm sure, still have their GPS infrastructure. They would still uh, rely on that, but they, like that cell tower, would also have the ability to tune that BPS signal uh, from a, a neighboring uh, site and to use that as well. Andrew. And I'm hoping that there's more questions out there, so I don't want to steal the mic too much, but I want to uh, put a question out there that's uh, maybe stimulating for the whole group, and it's a slightly different aspect, and it has to do, to, to pick your brain, uh, Sam, talk to me a little bit about uh, what kind of statistics the association or the group of broadcasters have about things like uptime of a transmitter? Because one of the common questions that comes into a resilience background is you have to build a stack. And that stack has to be pretty rock solid at the bottom or have some redundancy or whatever it is. Tell me a little bit about uh, a, an ATSC 3.0 transmitter or maybe a network of them, and, and what kind of uptimes you, you gather or see? Yeah, so um, I'm going to speak at a high level. I'm not going to be talking about mean time between failures. Of a well, I'm recording network. your answer. Yeah. Nuts. But, but, at, but, but at a high level, I think that that is really one of the strengths that, that we bring. Uh, one is, um, going back to what I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, each individual facility is designed to be on the air from a commercial basis on a 24 by 7 by 365 basis. They have inherent redundancy in the architecture. They have the UPS backup. They have the generators. They're part of the critical infrastructure. They're meant to stay on the air in emergencies. Um, time and time again, Maui wildfires, I think, would be a great recent example where broadcast stayed on the air when other uh, means of communications failed. Um, and so, and, and that's just one example, but that is for an individual facility. Then you say, well, okay, how many different towers are there in any given market? And so you have natural redundancy in the fact that each market is served by multiple transmitters. Then um, you've got the, the notion of, uh, you know, when you start to look at that coverage map, um, that, hey, I can receive 
on average 17 sites or if I'm willing to mount that antenna even higher, 70 sites. And those are going to be coming from different locations. So there is a lot of natural redundancy in the broadcast system as it's already constructed. Well, as, since I'm sitting in a college, it seems to me there's a, there's a master's or a PhD thesis right there. You throw a Poisson on 17x, you can start getting numbers like 10 to the minus 5. Yeah. Somebody I go look at that and say, here's an infrastructure that you can close analytics, intellectual development on those kinds of things that had been very hard problems for an entity like GPS. We spent 30 years getting a number about reliability like that. If you have an audience like this interested in, in the underlying thing, you can take what you're doing here in an academic institution and turn that into reliable and informed information that helps entities like Jennifer's and mine make easy ways to say yes. So I'll put it out there. 17x, yeah. I, I, if, who knows if it's a Poisson distribution, I don't know, but just going back to my academic roots, you, you're going to get to those 10 to the minus fives in a hurry. So let me just echo that and encourage you to take his advice and let's study this. Thank you. All right, I think those were all the questions that we had, but certainly I'm here all day and happy to continue the conversation offline. Thank you so much.